Is it moving? Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I never know anymore. Well, the rest of the show is like this one. So far, it's been good. <laughs> yeah, so far we're off to a to a to a difficult start. <laughs> Last week, um, we looked at the recent explosion, and and a few of us have been talking about it today, and. When we discussed it last week here, we talked about it as being connected to the sixth seal of the book of Revelation. And once again, I would caution you, especially for the people watching on TV, and I know that we have a lot of people that watch who won't admit it. I know that. <laughs> and I can understand that. And I'm not going to ask you to admit it. But you're not going to be able to deal with this unless you're prepared to refute the Bible as a holy book and look at it as a scientific book. Then you would have to consider, if I look at that book as a scientific book, who wrote it, you have to come to the conclusion that it was written by an advanced race of scientists. And that's... Once you, once you plug into that thought process, you really can start to open up a lot of uh, doors as far as understanding this stuff. Now, let me look for just a moment once again at the uh, sixth seal in Revelation 6.12, and it says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth as a fig tree casts her figs to the ground, blah, 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 blah. The, 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 given what we're experiencing now with this um, explosion in, in, in space, I wanted to really concentrate on number 13 there, and the stars of heaven fell onto the earth. Initially, you'd think of a catastrophic event, you know, but we know stars can't fall down to the earth because it would only take one star, and that would be the end of everything. But having looked at that prophecy of the star falling to the earth, and then we'll look just briefly, because we went through this last week, just briefly, at this situation that occurred on December the 27th, and this is the Hubble Space Telescope, the brightest galactic flash ever detected hits Earth. The brightest galactic flash ever detected hits the Earth. That just happened, I mean, you know, in December. And... Um, Reading that kind of pushes aside that it could be supernova 1987A because this particular explosion did not come from SN 1987A. But we could, and this is where we were coming last week, we could consider this as the sixth seal because it said the stars would fall from heaven. And, and this is basically right on the mark as we'll look at the next slide which says a huge explosion halfway across the galaxy packed so much power it briefly altered Earth's upper atmosphere in December. No known eruption beyond our solar system has ever appeared as bright upon arrival. You couldn't see it. The blast originated about 50,000 light years away and was detected December the 27th. Now, a light year is a distance light travels in a year about 6 trillion miles. So you got 50,000 times 6 trillion, so you can see you know, how far away this was. But it still impacted the Earth. Now, when we uh, looked at Revelation just a moment ago about the sixth seal, it said that when the sixth seal was opened, the stars fell to the Earth. Now, this is light that fell to the earth. And this particular event in December was unlike anything that has ever occurred before. 
Now notice where it says it briefly altered Earth's upper atmosphere. So now you have to, you have to ask yourself. The, the book of Revelation was saying that the light coming down from above, the energy coming down from above, the power coming down from above from angels and all that kind of business was directed to the earth. Well, so was this. This was directed to the earth. And this had an impact on the earth. So the question would be, is the light from above making changes to the earth? And if it is, then it pretty much confirms what we've been saying here. And that's something that you would have to give some thought to. The comments from the scientists about this explosion of light uh, were particularly interesting. We'll look at those. Uh, this one scientist, Phil Wilkinson of IPS Australia, was talking about this uh, event. And he says that it can reach out and tap us on the shoulder like this, reminds us that we really are linked to the cosmos, or you could say we really are linked to God. And, and, and this here, <coughs> this, one, this one, I have just never been able to get it out of my mind, the statement. This is a once-in-a-lifetime event, said Rob Fender of Southampton University in the United Kingdom. We have observed an object only 12 miles across on the other side of our galaxy, releasing more energy in the tenth of a second than the sun emits in 100,000 years. That's bizarre. That, 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 is, that is, you know, unfathomable. You can't consider it. It's, it's, but here it says it reaches out and taps us on the shoulder. Someone is tapping us on the, on the shoulder. Let's look at that verse in Revelation again, just one more time. And I beheld, when he opened the sixth seal, a great earthquake, the sun became black, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Now, what we found in the report was that this really was a star that had exploded and found its way to earth. So, in other words, if we were going to take this literally, which I don't do, the, the point here is that indeed this light did come down from a star. The star itself didn't fall, but the light certainly fell and hit the earth. Now, since the last time that we discussed this, which was last week, NASA has added some comments about this event that I wanted to, you know, briefly discuss with you. So we'll, we'll take a look at it in, in this one here. This is, uh, and, and this is the headline, Blast Affected Earth from Halfway Across the Milky Way. And that comes from the Center for Astrophysics News, and it was released February the 19th. And what do they say? Forget Independence Day, forget War of the Worlds. A monstrous cosmic explosion last December showed that the Earth is in more danger from real-life space threats than from hypothetical alien invasions. This, I mean, you know, this, this is a real thing. But still we can't shrug off what Revelation said because basically in the symbolisms of that book, power, energy, forces are being thrown down to affect the planet Earth. And here... In this report from NASA, we have confirmation that this cosmic event did affect planet Earth. The blast affected the Earth. And there's no way that a blast of that magnitude could affect the Earth without affecting living things on the Earth. It's impossible. So it had to inf uh, infect, yes, with energy, and affect everybody. But so you have something like this happen. It doesn't really draw the uh, comments from the religious ones because they don't, you know, it's not really religious stuff. This is science stuff. But what's the sense of reading Revelation material if we're going to fail to consider the relevancy of events such as this when they do occur? Something like this happens. Something like this happened. It could be the opening of the sixth seal of Revelation. And if it is, it is a 
you know, a bizarre story and something that the whole world has basically anticipated, but in a way that said, well, you know, I don't believe this stuff. But you got to believe this. What happened here is pretty close to what was described in the book of Revelation. And the power of it was, is it's just beyond description. More energy in one-tenth of a second. One-tenth of a second. I mean, that isn't even, you know, than the sun puts out in a hundred thousand years. And you know, what's interesting is they say, well, science has never seen anything like this. And if you've been coming here, you know that that's exactly what they said about Eta Carina. That's exactly what they said about Supernova 1987A. Let me show you, uh, I, this is pretty neat. This is an artist's conception from NASA of, of what occurred. And, and this, you know, the, in other words, you'd be kind of looking at the Earth behind this uh, explosion. And, and this would be the explosion of light. And, and this is how the Earth was affected. And it, and it just mushroomed out and, you know, touched the upper atmosphere of the Earth. <coughs> and that's a, that's a, a drawing from... Um, a, uh, an artist at NASA showing uh, that, you know, idea is that you can, you, can, you can see how the event basically placed a coating-like impact on the upper atmosphere of the Earth. And, and, and so we'd have to think, you know, if, if the Earth was affected in such a way by this, then everything living on the Earth would, would have to be affected as well. And, and that's where we come in to look at how is this going to change the way people think. And it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to see it today or tomorrow, but there's this change. There's a change in the way you feel. There's a change in the way you've been thinking. Um, and, and just what's going on up was something that, you know, I just, you know, the flare disrupted the Earth's ionosphere. It disrupted the Earth's ionosphere. So we're talking about a book called the Book of Revelation, which talks about, you know, symbolic evidence of, of things coming down to the Earth to disrupt the Earth. Here, you're seeing it happen. We don't know what's the effect of this going to be. We don't know yet. I certainly don't, not being a scientist. But the Earth's ionosphere was disrupted by this light. Look at this. If such a blast happened within 10 light years of the Earth, it would destroy much of the ozone layer, causing extinctions due to increased radiation. Extinction. Now, you can sit, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm sure you, you must, and because it's true. There's nothing you can do about this. What could you do? But what if, if we can, con you can take that. What if we can concentrate on what you can do about yourself and how this particular energy affects you? Does it make any sense to you that a blast can affect the planet and not affect us? Does it make any sense to you that if the circuitry in your brain was changed, uh, gates, electrical gates opened, that the modification would be that these energies could affect you in a positive way? In other words, change the circuitry first, and then this energy coming down, instead of affecting you in a negative way, affects you in a positive way. So where can we get some information about that? The only place really are ancient writings, this scientific journal known as the Bible, which has really been prostituted into a religious book, so, you know, as to evoke fear and control and bring money to these offending organizations. But if you're prepared, and this is a, this is a tall order, but I mean, you know, you can, you can go to church and sing, this is the day that the Lord has made, but this is also something the Lord has made here, it's going to blow your head off. 
If you're prepared to thumb your nose at religion and reconnect with what you refer to as God, then there is a way. There's a way that you can flow in harmony with this cosmic tsunami. You know, we were just talking about that. I love that line. A cosmic tsunami. And we just saw a, 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 an ocean tsunami, and we freaked out about that. Now we're seeing a cosmic tsunami. What's next? And what's, what's next could happen in the next five minutes. But what's next is on its way now. But there's a way that you can ride a meditational surfboard on top of this cosmic tsunami and be the recipient of positive power. We were, we were, when we were looking at the tsunami and talking about that a few weeks ago, there was a story about a guy who um, his, his wife and his children were up on a balcony watching him surf, and the tsunami came. And he knew, holy gee, you know, something. this wasn't the normal wave that he was looking for, but he had no choice. He just rode on top of it, and the doggone tsunami carried him right across the highway and over a couple of, you know, roads and everything and dumped him right in the parking lot of his hotel. He rode it. I mean, he flowed with the energy of it. And that's what I'm talking about. A meditational surfboard on top of this cosmic energy, which is actually could be called a cosmic tsunami. But this is what the Bible and this is what these other ancient documents are talking about. What I'm going to do tonight is, is something that I think is, is very, very important for you. Um, I'm going to provide you with the key. All right. And I'm going to provide you with that key, and if you use that key properly, it will open most of the coded messages found in the Bible and other ancient scriptures as well. Very few people have this key. So it's, it's quite a privilege for us to have it, to receive it, and you are about to receive it. So let's stick, uh, we'll stick to the Bible and not the other ancient books for the time being because uh, that's the book that we're most familiar with. Now here's the deal. And this is where we've got to come from, you know, as looking at the Bible as a scientific book. Then we're going to look and we're going to take the key, and the key is going to open up for us what all of this stuff means that has so many people. I mean, millions and millions of people totally freaked out and confused as to, you know, what it is and who wrote it, and they fight with each other. The Bible is a Greek document that was written, started 200 to 300 B.C., okay, in Alexandria, Egypt. Alexandria was a, was a, was a Greek colony at that time, founded by Alexander the Great in one of his conquests. It was the center of Zeus worship. It was the center of, of, of mythology and bringing the mythologies of Egypt and the mythologies of, of Greece together. There, in Alexandria, came forth the book that you know as the Bible. At that time, it was called the Septuagint. That was the name of it. So Greek mythologists, Egyptian mythologists, people who had lived in Israel and migrated around, came together, and in this mythological city of Alexandria, Egypt, not, not that it was a mythological, I mean, it was a real place, but uh, the center of mythology, came this book called the Septuagint that you know is the Bible. The Old Testament of the Bible became a Greek document, the Septuagint, between 200 and 300 B.C. And the New Testament was, was always Greek. But let me just show you a, a little write-up about that here in the next overhead. The Septuagint, sometimes abbreviated LXX, is the name given to the Greek translation of the Jewish scriptures. 
The Septuagint has its origin in Alexandria, Egypt, and was translated between 300 to 200 B.C., widely used among Hellenistic Jews. Now, Hellenistic Jews were people who came out of that part of the world and migrated into the world that was controlled by Greeks and took upon themselves, uh, you know, the, the social and the literary uh, things of the Greek. This Greek translation was produced because many Jews spread throughout the empire were beginning to lose their Hebrew language. So you have a Greek document written in Alexandria, which was the center of Zeus worship, which was the center of uh, mythological writings, and where the mythologies of Egypt and Greece came together. Now, it is very, very important to understand namely, that the Bible code demands an understanding of the nature of Greek mythology. You can't, it, 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 it astounds me how people, in, you know, especially in Christian circles will say, the Bible said this, the Bible said that. They're picking up a book that is Greek mythology, they're literalizing it, and missing, really, the entire uh, story that it has to tell. And if you can't accept the Bible as Greek mythology, you'll not be able to use the key. And the reason you won't be able to use the key is because the key is based entirely on Greek thought. You can take that. It's not that this is the only way one can understand these things. It is the way chosen to preserve the truth to await the evolution of the human mind in the West. Okay? How could the stories be devised? Just think of yourself if you were sitting back in there. How could you write stories? In other words, you're from a, an advanced race. You understand the atoms. You understand the electrons and the photons. You understand thousands of years of science, and yet you're in a society at the present time when this is being written, where the people are still at the stage of selling sheep and trying to make wheels and carts and splitting rocks. I mean, it was nothing. So what do you do? You can't sit down and talk to them about science. You can't sit down and talk to them about radiation. You can't talk to them about electromagnetism. They know sheep. What? So where, 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 what do you do? Where do you go with this? You have to then write these stories in such a way that they are hidden and then unveil themselves when you arrive at a point where you have evolved to be able to understand about all of the scientific stuff. Not only then would you be able to understand what they mean, but you also will understand that whoever wrote them was from an advanced civilization. See? So how could these stories be devised to describe how you may be saved out of the cosmic interactions with the Earth that are really getting hot and heavy right now? The brain mind that we all have must be changed in order for you to understand and in order for you to flow in harmony with this great Aquarian Passover change. The brain mind has to be changed. The circuitry has to be changed. But how does it happen? You know, what are the keys? And there is one main key which I will give you now. This key controls most of the ancient biblical writings. And once you're determined to understand this, and once you're willing to allow the electrical impulses to open circuits within you so as to the change can take effect, then you'll make this key a vital part of your experience of study in the New Age. And, and we'll go on now, and I'll, and I'll share this key with you. This is uh, basically it. 
knowing that the, the, the Greek, you know, this is an interesting thing too with the origin of the father in ether, uh, which is the yeah. The key to understanding the Bible and to understanding the ancient myths is built around the levels of the mind that one encounters in meditation. Now, there's no earth inside, there's no water inside, there's no air inside, there's no fire, blah, blah, blah. These are simply terms to describe the various circuits inside of the brain mind and how they will be affected and how these things will change. I mean, you know, we're talking about very complex circuits. And so th in order to try to simplify it, the stories mythologically were talking about earth, water, air, fire, and then the renewed mind as the parts of the circuitry of the brain mind. Okay. Here's one right here. When, how many times have you heard somebody called an airhead? Well, that's where it came from. Just about every story you will read in the Bible or in Greek mythology is based on that premise of earth, water, air, fire, and the new mind. That's the key. Once you've got that, you can understand and you'll start to forward and start to look at things in a whole different way. As you allow different electrical circuits in your brain mind to be activated in meditation, they have a differing effect on the way you think. The way you handle external electrical stimulation such as cosmic explosions that we're just talking about. Let's say, how do we explain? Let's say you have a lamp connected to an outlet. But you get a small TV. But there's only one outlet. So all you can have is the lamp. You can't, there's no outlet, so you can't see the programs on the TV. So you buy a small receptacle. And that small receptacle accommodates two plugs. So now you're able to use the lamp and the TV. In other words, you change the flow of the electricity and a positive reaction has occurred. Your computer brain is similar except you don't have any way to change the circuitry. You can't buy any plugs. You can't buy any outlets. So how could this possibly happen? You have to accommodate these additional electrical signals that are flowing. But how? And the, the point here is there is a way. So what the, <coughs> what the ones in Alexandria were faced with, how do you develop a method of instruction that is written thousands of years ago, but will be ready for you when you evolve to a point where you can understand it, which is now. Now, it's kind of like algebra. Algebra is not taught in the first grade, but when you have evolved and are ready for it later in life, it's there. You know, it's complete gibberish when you're very young. But as you get older and you evolve to a point where you can accept it, then it's there. But it was written long before you evolved to the point of being able to understand it. <coughs> you can take that. Now, the brain mind is a complex organ of interacting electrical circuits. Hey. Let me show you something here. What you're looking at here are electrical circuits of a human brain, the neurons, the interconnecting neurons of a, of a human brain. Interestingly enough, this picture next to it travel over this particular route of a circuit, but it may be blocked here. And, 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 and you can't make it to this point. And so a gate opens here, 
and since the signal is blocked, the gate opens here, and you make it up here by following a different route. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is the meditation actually corrects the situation inside of the human brain mind in the neurons to open pathways that have to be cleared if you're able to become enlightened, if you're able to become, you know, to understand and to be saved out of that which is coming down. That's what this is all about. See how similar then the cosmos, the cosmic brain is to the human brain, and truly they're the same. Well, in, in that thing which is on top of your shoulders and is the massive tangled web, there's a way to allow your brain to receive electrically. The impulses will change the gates. That's, that's one of the interesting things. In, the, in computers, the um, logic circuits of a computer are called gates. The logic circuits of the computers of the brain are called OR gates, or G-A-T-E-S. And of course, the, the person who is the king of computers, I would assume, throughout the world is also named Gates. And so, what this is speaking of, is a change in those electrical pathways so that paths that are closed and have to be opened are opened, and paths that are open and should be closed are closed. So then the direction of your thought patterns, which have been going this way, will no longer go this way because they'll be shut off here. It will have to go that way. And you'll understand things that you don't understand now. You'll see things, you'll evaluate things, you'll know what to do, you'll know where to go because you won't be over here in oblivion, you'll be here, but it takes the, the change of the pattern to the circuit. It's like throwing a switch, you know how to, the engineer or whoever they do, do does it on the train, they throw a switch and instead of the train going this way, the train makes a turn and goes that way. It's the same basic principle inside of the mind. And the reason that this is so important is that you're able to flow in harmony with this coming change. You're able to ride that cosmic surfboard on that cosmic tsunami and not suffer the meltdown that so many others who refuse the instructions will suffer. I mean, it's happening right in front of you. you between, the, between the storms and the, and the changes in the atmosphere, the changes in the way that people think, the violence that we've seen in front of us, and, everybody, and nobody can even talk about it. Or what can you do? You know, everybody just throws up their hands and just tries to survive. But that's not, that's not necessary, and that's not something you should do. You can take care of yourself. The meditation will take care of you, and it doesn't cost you anything, and you don't join anything, but it actually becomes a part of you and actually does change these circuits in your brain, mind, so that you're able to flow in the harmony as this comes on. Now, the instructions of Jesus, you can take that down, are clear. And what does he say? What Jesus says in the Bible is you've got to look within. That's the first thing you've got to do. You've got to take no thought. You've got to separate from thought. You've got to watch. You've got to watch yourself. And you've got to stimulate the single eye. Now, the single eye is, is an organ in, in the brain. And it's called the pineal gland. The word means pine cone. You know why it's called pine cone? We, we live right where this event occurs, where the pine cone is closed up tight and takes extreme heat or fire in order to open it, and then the seed spreads and there's new life in the forest. That happens right here in the pine barren. That pine cone is the same thing. It's the electrical energy coming up the spine that acts as the fire that lights that pine cone and causes the explosion of light and then seeds of new life. That's, that's why it's called the pine cone. One of the interesting pictures, uh, you, you can see if you look at the Vatican sometime, is a 
they have a gigantic statue right in front of the building of a pine cone. I don't know if they have any idea why it's there, but it's there. So Jacob turns around in this Bible. And he says he met God face to face, and he calls the place Peniel. It's in the Old Testament. That's what I'm trying to tell you. It's not a holy book. It's a scientific book. He calls the place Peniel. And if you've never seen that, you, then you, you should, and I'll show it to you. Now, what, what happens here is, before you put that on, Jacob is struggling with a man. Yeah. So now you can start breaking down all of this, uh, these, these, these mythological stories. But he's struggling with a man. The man is himself. This is the struggle that each one of us go through. The stress, the inner, the inner wheeling and dealing that we were involved in all the time. And it says that as he's struggling with this man, the man puts Jacob's thigh out. The thigh, for obvious reasons, is the symbol of desire. Well, actually, obviously, it's sexual desire. But it's a symbol, it becomes a mythological symbol of physical desire, and that is put out. What that means is, in one's inner struggle with himself, all desire goes. And one settles into a, into a condition of total separation from thought, OK? Take no thought. When you take no thought, your thigh has been put out. Desire is gone. That's where God appears. The activation and meditation of the single eye or the pineal gland of the brain. And what it happens in this particular story, Jacob has what they call an epiphany. That's a, a holy day in, in some church. Go look up the pineal gland sometime in your dictionary, and you'll find it's called another name as well. You know what it's called? Epiphysis. That's the name of the pineal gland, epiphysis. It means enlightenment. But what, so in this mythology of this story, struggling with himself, you and I struggling with ourselves, and then the desire nature is put out, separation from thought, and enlightenment happens. And Jacob, according to the story, turns around and he names the place where this occurred. And it says here in Genesis, and Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. I mean, what, what more, you know, and a Jesus turns around and says, practice the single eye, which is the pineal gland. Jacob calls the place pineal. I mean, and you know, you, know the, you know the terrible thing about that? And everybody has a pineal gland. In other words, everything in these stories between Jacob and Jesus is right smack here in your head. And, and, and there's, not a church, there's not a church in the world that ever mentioned the story, not, never even, even said anything about it, told nobody about it. As he passed over, Penuel is another... It's a, you know, play on words of the same thing, Peniel. The sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. And that, of course, I put the single eye in the center there. Now, notice as he passed over Peniel, another version of Peniel, the sun rose upon him. In other words, as he passed over, pass over, which we're, you know, talking about. Now, when I'm talking about a cosmic Passover, I'm talking about a mental Passover, I'm talking about a spiritual Passover. As he passed over the pineal, the sun rose upon him. What's that mean? He had an epiphysis. He became enlightened. You become enlightened. As you pass over the pineal, you become enlightened. And it says, and he halted upon his thigh. In other words, he was limping. Difference. The desires were still there. He's limping as part of the physical part of his existence. But they were no longer controlling him. It was a limp, but he was able to move. Do you see that? See? So he becomes enlightened over the pineal. 
And though he's limping, in other words, desire is always going to be with us in the physical realm, but it's not going to control him. He's able to move. So this story is talking about you right now today, inside of you. What goes on inside of you? And what happens inside of you when finally you're struggling with yourself and you're, you've got this battle going on inside of your head and then finally you realize that if you can shut down the thoughts of the mind which are freaking you out, really, then the desire is gone, the thigh is put out and the pineal lights and enlightenment takes place. Okay, you can take that. So we return to the key. We return to the key of earth, water, air, fire, mind. And you are clear on what it is. The key is simply ancient mythological ways of describing the powers of the various circuits in the human brain mind. Now, and as I told you earlier, just about everything in ancient Greek scriptures, including the Bible, uses that key. And it's very, very important for you to understand it. It's not rocket science. It's not hard to understand. The key, earth, water, air, fire, is turned on during meditation. This is meditation, all right? Meditation. It occurs during meditation. Earth, water, air, fire, the new mind. In other words, these circuits become active in meditation. It activates itself. It activates itself when you've been struggling with yourself, but you, when you allow the desires to be put out, when you separate from thoughts so that you can flow without any thought of any kind, that's where the activation comes in. And so then your brain mind becomes receptive to new circuit additions, changes. So you're going to have five elements to guide you in understanding the coded language in the Bible. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to give you examples and show you how that works. Earth, water, air, fire, and the new mind. You'll use these elements as follows. The earth the physical body and brain. Physical. You know, material. Water is the first reaction of the brain-mind to meditation. In other words, when you first get into meditation, you first start to drift away, just the beginning of it, that part is water. The electrical circuit that starts to become active is described by the mythologist as water. The head, earth, the brain, earth, and now into this meditation, it just starts to activate and it's water. Air being a higher reaction of the brain mind to meditation above the water. Air, okay? A higher reaction. We're deeper into the meditation tonight, okay? We're rising out of the water and into the air, all right? And then fire, a higher reaction of the brain to meditation above the air, fire. And so we, we come here to a, to a very deep, high Kundalini-type moment called fire. And basically, you know, there's no fire, there's no air, there's no water. But some way, there's got to be a way to, so you can identify how this works to come up to that new mind with, with, with the ability to think, with the ability to make contact again with, 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 the, with the higher elements of light beings and so forth and so on. The new mind changed by the meditation process, new circuits and gates to accommodate that power to reconnect us to what we call God, you know? Now this key doesn't cost you anything. You don't have to join anything. You don't have to become part of any group. You simply allow it to work within itself. But when you start to understand how it's used, things start to make sense to you. And when things start to make sense, then you have more confidence in it. 
Somebody tells you you have faith, you have no confidence in anything. You'll, you'll, you'll pray and you'll say, yes, thank you very much. But when you get away from people, you struggle, that fight goes on inside of you. All hell breaks loose, that always has. So this key is inside of you and you must practice that fact. Earth, water, air, fire, these are points of electrical change within the brain mind. So let's look at a biblical scripture. Hold just a second. Watch it take on new meaning based on the key. Look at the key again. Earth, water, air, fire, the new mind. Now, let's look at the scripture. Matthew 14, 24, the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, and in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went into them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying it's a spirit. But straightway Jesus said, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Now, use, use, use the key. Where was Jesus walking? On the water. So in other words, when the physical part was able to rise to this circuit, the contact with the Jesus part occurred. And the, and the first thing that happens is you become frightened of the whole thing. What the heck is going on here? You know, I got this feeling. It's freaking me out. What is all this about? And when this occurred was in the midst of a storm. Remember, the struggle goes on inside of you. The struggle is inside of you. There is a storm inside of you. You're inside of your boat, which is inside of your body. And then in the midst of the storm, you enter into your meditation and you start to rise into that circuit called water and something appears. Something is there. Something, you got that feeling. Something is touching you and it says, it's me. Don't be afraid. Troubles were all around. But in water part, the meditative brain mind, Jesus appears. And now let's see what happens next. And Peter says, Lord, if this is you, tell me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter came out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind and everything, he was afraid and he began to sink. How many times have you reached a stage of meditation where your circuit seemed to be flowing smoothly, you reach to that point of this Jesus appearance, and all of a sudden, you start thinking about things that are on your mind or troubling you, and bang, down you go. It's over. It's over. Your encounter is over. There's nobody physically walking on the water. Nobody walks on the water. God didn't make water to walk on. If he's a magician, that well, doesn't make him God. I mean, what the heck is he, the great Kreskin? What, what is this? This has nothing to do with that. It has to do with this. It has to do with the key. You encounter Jesus in that circuit of meditation. But you've got to keep yourself focused. You've got to keep, as soon as the thoughts come back, gone. As soon as the thoughts come back, bang, down you go. You know? That's why the, the music plays, you can feel it, you can sense it, you know, and it's going well, and then you start thinking, oh, you got to pay the bill, or this has happened, and the doctor said this, and down it goes. The electrical circuits of the brain mind are the key elements that are described by the earth, water, air, fire, and the new mind. You can take that thing, Jeff. Using the key, earth, water, air, fire, new mind. Let's look at a couple more scriptures and 
see if they point us in the right direction as opposed to what we were taught in the past. You ready for this one? Okay, let's take a look at it. First Thessalonians, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. You see? In other words, now you've overcome this part. Your meditation has deepened. The circuits are activated here. And you come into this higher part, totally separated from thought, which is in the air. Do you notice something here? You know what this is, really? It's been screwed up by religion terribly. But you know what this is? This is baptism. This is baptism. When you take the head, go into the water, come up into the air, and are touched by the fire or spirit. That's baptism. But the culture of our world thinks it's more important than your head gets wet than your mind gets changed. And so here, when we get, we're going to be caught up to meet God and Jesus in the air, in, 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 in uh, Christianity, they, they have something called rapture, and people go shooting out of convertible cars. You can see this in these bookstores. They have little cars. Cars are empty, and the people go shooting out through the convertible cars. Well, I'm glad they use convertibles. <laughs> but it's a, it's a level of meditation, and none of this is serious. None of this means anything to these people. They'd rather fly out of a car than have their mind changed. See, God doesn't care whether you fly out of a car or get your head wet. The idea is, are you going to get your mind changed? Look at this one here, Matthew 3.11. This is John talking. I baptize you with water. But he that comes after me is mightier. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. It's the same thing. You see? Jesus represents the higher of the earth, water, air, fire. John represents the lower of the earth, water, air, fire. And he's simply using two names to set up two levels of the earth mind circuitry. You know what's very interesting about this? You can take that. We talk about these electrical circuits, which we've been talking about here. There's an interesting point. When the women come to the tomb, you know, in that story about Jesus, the angel tells the women, you're not going to find him here. And they say, well, where is he? He's gone into Galilee. You know what the word Galilee means? Circuit. It means circuit. You'll find him in the circuit. Earth, water, air, fire, new mind. The earth mind of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what it is. It was th th that never happened. That story never happened. What good would it be? You, make, you, you burn a town down, and so another town's coming. There are millions of towns. The earth mind of Sodom and Gomorrah is overcome by fire. And then the chosen ones ascend up to the mountain. Moses tends the flock of the priest of Midian in the desert, giving them water. Then he ascends at the backside of the desert to the mountain and encounters the burning bush of fire. Everything in the book is based on that. And it's all based on the change of the mind, the inner brain mind. Jesus says, you go fishing, drop your line in the water, and you'll find what you need in the mouth of a fish, because fish are what exist in the depths of the water. But this is not wet water. It's the invisible water inside of you. Drop your line into the water in your meditation. Allow the brain mind to be changed and the electrical circuitries to be changed as you raise yourself into that second stage of consciousness. Ezekiel encounters UFOs and he sees them in the air and coming out of them are fire. 
It's all about the inner you and the need for you and me to submit to, the, to this correction of the circuitry because it is the time of the passing over. Now, this um, key does not apply solely to the Bible. All right? It is Greek in origin and transcends the Bible. Tuesday evening, as part of the um, meditation, we played Stravinsky's The Firebird. It's a classical piece inspired by the myth of the phoenix or the firebird. Let's take a look at it. The firebird. Now here's, let me, let me just stay with me. We're going to wrap up here. In ancient Egyptian mythology, the phoenix is a mythical sacred firebird. The phoenix is a bird with beautiful gold and red plumage. And it flies and it does its thing, but at the end of its life cycle, it builds itself a nest of wood. It ignites this nest, and it is emulated in fire and burned to nothing. But then out of the ashes rises the new phoenix. And the new phoenix will take the ashes of the old to the city of the sun, Heliopolis. The Greeks adopted the word benu, B-E-N-U, and took further meaning of uh, the phoenix, identified it with their own word phoenix. And according to the Greeks, now this is how it takes a little different tact. The phoenix or firebird lived in Arabia next to a well of cool water. And it bathed in the water of the well, and the Greek sun god Apollo would love to s listen to and hear it as it did that. The, the myth is played out in Shakespeare's play called The Tempest. But for the most part, religions and traditions look at the myth uh, as a story of birth, death, and rebirth, but it's much more than that. As we get to the Greek version of the myth, take out your key of earth, water, air, fire, and a new mind. The, the word benu means the risen one. So let's look again at the mythology of the phoenix and apply the same key we were applying to the Bible. Hmm? Okay. In Greek legend, the phoenix lived in Arabia near a cool well. Think of the water. Every morning as the sun rose and dawn broke, it would immerse itself in the cool, clear water of the well and sing such a delightful and sweet song that the sun god would stop his chariot to listen to the beautiful sound. Every 500 years as death approached, it would construct a nest of sweet-smelling wood that it would then set upon fire, the flames consuming the bird. From the ashes, a new phoenix arose, which would wrap up the ashes in a parcel of myrrh, flying to Heliopolis, the city of the sun, also called On in Egypt. It was deposit the ashes on the altar of Ra, the sun god. Now, what does the bird, the bird is the physical earth, do first? Okay? The fire bird. The first thing it does is immerse itself in the water. What, how many, uh, two, minutes. two. The first thing it does is immerse itself in the water. <laughs> Just let it run out. I won't, I won't be much longer, but I don't want to blow this. Then when the time is at hand, it flies into the air up into the nest. And there it sets itself and is consumed in the flame of fire. Do you see it? That's what the phoenix, you're the phoenix. You're the fire bird. Because as your meditation takes you into that stage, you rise up through the air and then here to the point of fire. 
and out of the ashes of that fire within you rises a new you. Do you know that nobody knows that? Well, they say it's death and rebirth, but they don't. They know you can look everywhere you want. Nobody has ever connected the Greek earth, water, air, fire, and new mind to the phoenix firebird. It's you. Ra is amen, Ra, who people acknowledge at the end of every prayer. And so here's the thing. When it is time, and you know when it is time, you go to your nest, and your nest is inside of you. Here, it is the meditation. You become the firebird. And through the water, you rise to the fire, and you're consumed, and out of the ashes of that mystical fire arises a new you. I want to show you just real quickly, and I'm done, how this plays out in locations where there may be a different symbol. You remember how the firebird will make his nest out of sweet wood? Well, in Chinese, they, they have a little different in the levels of the mind, but look at where ours is water in the second. Look what theirs is. And they have their firebird, too. So as you connect the various aspects and variations of this myth, you also see the sun. It descends, dies in the winter solstice of darkness, only to rise again to sit at the right side and on June 21st, the summer solstice. Jesus, the sun god, dies and rises again. 